Uh, again, thanks to Serge for, for inviting me, but of course the, the post-launch spot, of course, is always the trickiest, so I'll be looking for the people sleeping, and if anyone's drooling, I will call you out on it, so, <laughs> so just beware. So shifting gears a little bit from our symposium discussion and looking at another kind of subset, uh, and those being those individuals with early myelofibrosis. How should we really be uh, viewing these individuals? Uh, indeed, uh, uh, an area of unmet need. Uh, as we've done surveys amongst patients, we did a landmark survey. Indeed, the issue of progression is really at the very top of the mind of individuals that face the disease. Uh, and that can be a little bit of a disconnect where, where us sometimes as treating physicians, you know, looking at more short-term sort of goals, when you have the disease, the issue of progression is very foremost in your mind. My disclosures uh, have not changed dur during, uh, during the last couple hours, but, 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 uh, but if somebody's got a good idea, I'm, I'm always up to add more disclosures. So what about, what is early myelofibrosis? Again, even the concept is a little bit uh, of a query. Does it mean that you were just diagnosed? Does it mean you have mild anemia? Do you have just symptoms? Do you have splenomegaly, but it's not significant? Do you, is it early in terms of fibrosis or molecular markers? Again, so it's mixed. Myelofibrosis is heterogeneous. We've met patients that have had myelofibrosis for 30 years and not progressed. We've had others who from the very day they are diagnosed, they have very advanced disease. So clearly these can all be contributors, but I do not think necessarily time is really a, a strong factor in terms of that piece. Now time can certainly be a piece in terms of progression. If we think about myelofibrosis and time in each stage of risk, this was a nice uh, analysis done where they showed the median time spent in each of these risk categories in patients who were followed serially over time. So again, if you're low risk, a different construct, but you may spend the most amount of time in that segment, even individuals up to 27 years in that segment in that analysis. But again, in median, it's not permanent as it is a progressive disease for most. Now, as we think about the issue of risk and what's early myelofibrosis, is early myelofibrosis lower risk? Even as we look at risk scores, they're helpful, but they're not perfect uh, for several reasons. Particularly as we look at things of continuous variables, one can look at subcutoffs to see differences. We know hemoglobin of less than 10 is a risk factor, but if you subdivide those less than 12, they do clearly do worse than those that are above 12. Uh, if the platelets are under 150, does that matter? Yes. Uh, splenomegaly clearly can be a factor. Now, people sometimes ask, well, why is splenomegaly not considered one of the main risk factors in MF? And part of that may be the limitation of really medical documentation. You know, as we think about medical records from 30 years ago, which is what these data are based upon, you're lucky if people documented vital signs. You know, but the spleen size, you look in these charts and it's spleen big, spleen huge, spleen four finger breadth below the costal margin. Well, what the heck does that mean? You know, whose who's fingers? So the data is worthless, absolutely worthless data. You know, so it's not a risk factor because it's worthless data. Because do patients with a 30 centimeter spleen do worse than patients that the spleen is not palpable? Of course they do. It's just logical. It's just the data wasn't there. Other things that weren't there, ascites. Patients that have ascites, these patients do not do well. However, it's not one of the risk factors because again, there's no quantified way it was assessed. Now, clear interest, and this is a focus later on in terms of better understanding the molecular prognostic score, <clears throat> and with this, we'll be identifying how we can differentiate based on molecular features subpopulations with a low and intermediate one. And I won't focus on this now to not steal uh, the thunder from my colleagues later in the day, but that is to a factor. Now, what is the burden of early MF? Well, you've seen this slide that symptoms clearly matter, but a second question is, is there an amount of symptoms that really is a trigger for therapy? 
So we did an analysis which we presented at EHA trying to look at symptoms alone and how they really relate to severity of the disease, whether a symptom is absent or present, and then how many patients on a zero to 10 scale for individual symptoms have it as a score of two or three or four or five and how they correlate with other aspects of the disease such as spleen, risk, etc. A complicated mathematical analysis which, which our statistician, she, she, she brings out the crayons for me, she's brought out the blocks to try to explain it to me, I, I'm kind of lost, but, but, but suffice it to say that through these analysis that are quite sophisticated, we're able to determine in particular that as we look at issues of risk, spleen, disease severity, individual symptoms of greater than five are strong outliers and can be considerations of potential need for therapy or total symptom scores greater than 20. These individuals with either of these, one, are outliers compared to other patients with the disease, have stronger disease-related features, and we're trying to validate this in other prospective ways. Now, as we think about early disease, and I am interested in the concept of how symptoms help inform us regarding therapy in early disease, we need to know what symptoms tell us about MPN biology. How much are they a biological marker of the disease? Is pruritus really a markers of cytokines, inflammation, and other pieces? How much of it is cognitive in terms of stress, anxiety, things of that nature? And again, there's probably some contribution of both. If you have a chronic disease with uncertainty in the future, that is a negative, but also very specific signs and symptoms clearly can be related to aspects of the disease which are quantifiable, but we don't normally quantify because of even ease of testing. So they are good surrogate markers for inflammation and other cytokines. Indeed, as part of the early ruxolinib studies in which Dr. Verstavchuk and I and Teferi were engaged, it was clear from cytokine array analysis that cytokines are quite increased with the disease, they correlate with the symptoms, and they did improve in response to therapy. Now, cytokines that are related to symptoms may well have impact on the bone marrow microenvironment that may have impact on issues of progression. Indeed, as we think about a variety of these cytokines, they can increase fibrosis, but they can impact a hematopoiesis, and they can impact the disease. My colleague, uh, Ayelu Teferi, with some of these analysis, was able to demonstrate that certain of these cytokines, in particular, interleukins uh, 8, 12, 15, and the receptor for 2, each had an independent negative prognostic impact. So again, all of these things are tied together. Now, what about therapy for this group of patients? Ruxolitinib, as we discussed in the prior session, is approved currently for an intermediate and high risk in MF and second line in PVERA, uh, off-label in ET. Experimental studies in particular for low risk, which we'll get around to in a moment, and combinations, which we'll discuss later this afternoon, in higher risk. Now, this initial study clearly showed benefits of splenomegaly and symptoms. And the population was intermediate to and high risk. But this was not a scientifically based uh, eligibility. When we first started these studies, before the drug had been tested really in humans, it was felt for the conditions of safety in a drug not yet tested in man to treat the sickest patients with myelofibrosis. But there was never a scientific rationale from the beginning that the drug would not be helpful in individuals with low and intermediate one risk disease. It was just a clinical trial decision. So let me give you an example uh, of first an intermediate one risk patient. 63, PVERA 12 years, progressive post-PVMF, symptomatic, big spleen, hemoglobin still 11.8, 2% myelocytes, post-PV myelofibrosis. This individual, by risk score, as symptoms as the main driver, although again, flirts with some of the other risk scores. 
However, if we think about the burden of disease, they both have splenomegaly and symptoms, and in many ways is a very logical patient to consider for therapy. They begin ruxolinib twice a day, and we monitor for a response. Four months later, the spleen has shrunk. The symptoms are better. Uh, the counts are tolerable, and the patient has a clear benefit and response, irrespective of the fact that it was intermediate one versus intermediate two. Now, in the robust study in the UK, uh, they included individuals that had uh, intermediate one, intermediate two, and high-risk disease. And what they identified in terms of benefit is that the individuals with intermediate one risk disease had similar benefit to the other groups. So there was no uh, additional benefit, but there was no less benefit than in the other groups. And again, I view the phenotype around the disease helping me determine therapy as much as I do the issue of risk. Indeed, I look at the issue of risk as being most germane to the discussion of stem cell transplantation and less so for the th discussion of medical therapy. In the JUMP study, which was a, uh, a, the expanded access program outside of the U.S. for use of ruxidum in patients with myelofibrosis, they similarly included patients who had intermediate one risk disease, and both in terms of efficacy and safety, they found the experience to really be compatible to those with intermediate two and high-risk myelofibrosis. So again, for intermediate one, really finding a very similar experience to intermediate two and high-risk patients. Now, what about low risk? Well, in low risk, again, low risk is heterogeneous, uh, as are all of the other criteria. But in low risk, it's already been identified, and we discuss later today, that there are molecular subgroups that clearly are more problematic in that low risk population, with the presence of mutations such as ASX01, EZH1 and 2, uh, SRSF2, IDH1 and 2, et cetera. So this is an ongoing study that has been begun where ruxolinib versus placebo for low risk patients, but who have higher risk molecular features. With progression-free survival as the endpoints, progression is judged by a variety of markers, including the development of symptoms. And in this one, we looked at specific symptoms that are more associated with more advancing myelofibrosis, such as uh, pathologic weight loss, night sweats, et cetera. Now, what other agents are relevant for early myelofibrosis? So one, there is interest in interferon. You heard from our colleague yesterday, Dr. Uh, Silver, regarding interferon in MPNs. And particularly in this group of patients, it's of uh, interest. Uh, there's a study ongoing at my center, which is accruing with P1101, long-acting interferon, trying to uh, decrease progression in this group of patients. Uh, in addition, there are parallel studies going on with Dr. Silver's group. Now, what about non-pharmacologic approaches? This is an area of great interest. One, uh, at a high level, there are collaborative efforts now ongoing between the MPN Research Foundation and the scientific community looking at gene editing. This has not yet reached the level of human clinical trials, but is uh, an investigational effort looking at gene editing as a way to try to uh, impact patients with earlier disease. And I say this is an ongoing collaborative effort. CRISPR is just one of these gene editing platforms. Will it be this platform? Will it be a different one? It's tough to know. On the one hand, it's very uh, appealing uh, in that these are genetically based diseases. On the other hand, it is complex. As you'll see in the discussions of the genetics, there are multiple genetic mutations. And trying to edit more than one mutation might be really quite problematic. Uh, we know the JAK2 mutation is important, but it's not our only mutation that is relevant. So there are a lot of complexities at play. The second are non-pharmacologic interventions. There's a lot of interest from my group in terms of non-pharmacologic interventions in this earlier group to try to greater empower patients uh, as well in terms of 
uh, fitness, uh, anxiety, things of this nature. We've had a uh, ongoing pilot study and a second one which is on uh, opening with a meditative movement study. This was a, a at-home online yoga study where we worked with an online yoga provider to specifically film uh, online yoga modules developed for MPN patients with splenic modifications that could then be uh, utilized at home. Tremendous interest, 250 patients enrolled in this globally in four days. So there's a lot, a lot of interest in trying to fight back. Uh, we only wanted 50 patients for the initial pilot study. They had home Fitbits as well as other information. We look forward to sharing that additional data with everyone at ASH later this year. And the second pilot study is ongoing based on experiences from the first, where we have concurrent biomarkers which can be uh, uh, collected by saliva with patients collecting them at home for kind of a home-based approach. We have uh, in parallel uh, an additional study which is a beginning uh, regarding other sort of uh, online interventions, both physical as well as uh, psychological in terms of mood and things of that nature. So perhaps at a high level, let me give you a, a snapshot of how I view the therapy uh, for myelofibrosis. Uh, we do not have NCCN guidelines yet, although they might be forthcoming very soon, that uh, one, patients have both assessment of risk and symptoms. Patients with low risk and no symptoms, truly at this juncture, one can make a case for continuing to observe them. That being said, I think that one can make a case in this population for clinical trials. Again, I think it is a decision in a progressive disease like this, whether it be interferon or that ruxolitinib study. If you're low risk and you're symptomatic, I suspect that you're not as low risk as we thought. You know, again, a limitation of those old charts. If people weren't charting vital signs 25 years ago, they sure were not documenting symptoms. You know, anything that was documented in there was really the, the most extreme, uh, and you were lucky to kind of get a comment. So it's difficult to know that impact on long-term uh, prognosis for patients, but it's likely relevant. And if you're low risk, you're probably not really uh, and symptomatic. Uh, the therapy certainly can be a consideration, whether that, if it's problematic enough to consider JAK inhibition or some other intervention. Now, the vast majority of patients fall into that higher risk category, They're the focus of other talks today, but I'd say just at a high level, I really break that down as first a discussion regarding transplantation, urgent or delayed. JAK inhibition is our standard, uh, perhaps with the exception being individuals that really overlap with MDS with anemia as their primary driver. So putting it all together, really trying to think about our myelofibrosis patient, the patient with early myelofibrosis, of which we're trying to weigh the risks and benefits of intervention, transplant, other sorts of activities, and early disease, meaning either early in time, early in burden, early in risk. There are many factors for us to consider. I hope we continue to develop better ways of trying to identify patients that need early pharmacologic intervention, as well as that we have more tools. Indeed, I think we only have observation in myelofibrosis at the moment as an option, primarily because of the limitations of the therapies that we historically have had way in the past. So when hydroxyurea was pretty much the main therapy and it was pretty limited, it was pretty easy to say that there was a huge group of patients who did not benefit. But as our therapies become more nuanced over time, uh, I think there's few that will leave with a progressive disease like myelofibrosis untreated. With that, I would like to thank my group. I, I'm uh, very fortunate to have a very engaged group of colleagues working alongside me, focusing on several areas, including new drug development, quality of life and symptomatic assessment, non-pharmacologic interventions, and improving transplant outcomes. Thank you.